steadfast love, O oh God, the children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life, in your light do we see light. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the light of the gospel that shines on our hearts and lives through Jesus Christ. We thank you for the work of your spirit in illumining our hearts that we might see the glories and wonders of your love. We pray this morning that your blessing would be on us as we gather for worship. We pray that you equip us for loving you and serving you uh, this day. We pray for your blessing on us through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Remain standing and Rick will introduce our first hymn. Okay, our opening hymn is number 97. We praise you, O God, our Redeemer, Creator, number 97. Forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
6. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On the very day his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the, is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. The next reading is in Luke chapter 6, verses 6 to 19. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And a man there of his right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath, so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. He rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them, all he said to them, at them all, he said to them, stretch out your hand. And he did so. His hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and disgust with one another what they might do to Jesus. These days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. When day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became the traitor. They came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples, and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem, and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him, and he healed them all. Lastly, John 17, 1 to 19. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I have with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. They have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. 
For I have given them the words you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in the truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them, and not praying for the world, or for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world. They may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth, your word is true. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. Those who serve here at home, 
We continue to uphold our regional home missionary before you. Pray for Dave Holmblad and his family. Thank you for sparing him and his family of uh, significant harm and damage to their home uh, from the storm this past week. Lord, we do pray that you would help to provide for him as he clears the fallen trees and uh, assesses uh, his property at this time. We pray for your care and provision for him. Bless him also with wisdom as he uh, seeks to advance the work of your kingdom. We thank you for the uh, church plant that is developing in the Mechanicsville area, and we pray that your spirit would cause that effort to flourish and grow. Uh, we do pray for other possible contacts and locations to plant churches, give David uh, wisdom and leading uh, through the opening of doors for him, and pray for that you would uh, build your church according to your will. Father, we do pray for our presbytery as we will be meeting in a couple of weeks. We pray that our deliberations would be faithful to Scripture, faithful to Christ our Savior, good for your church. We pray that you protect us from all evil and harm. Father, we pray that you would minister to us this day as we walk in fellowship with you. We pray that as we take part in the communion meal, we would know your mercies, love, and fellowship. We pray that you strengthen us by grace to look to Christ crucified for us. We pray for your blessing on us in our time together and ask that you would teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is 465, Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord. 465, shall we stand?
And Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your plans, and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and touch the lintel on the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this rite as a statue for you and for your sons forever. When you come to the land that the Lord your, that the Lord will give you, as He has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? You shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for He passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when He struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, and he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, oh, go out from among my people both you and the people of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up on their cloaks, on their shoulders. The people of Israel also had also done as Moses told them. For they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. We pray, O Lord, that your spirit would bless you the word to our hearts. We pray that you would help us to look to Christ who watches over us. We pray in his name. When you're trying to make your way through seminary, you end up taking up quite a few odd jobs. And I've had the occasion to drive a truck uh, delivering vegetables to an Acme store and other places along the way. That was rather harrowing because I'm not used to driving a big truck with a trailer. 
Uh, one of the other jobs that I had was working as a night watchman. Uh, this, I think, I was just substituting for a friend. It wasn't a regular job for me, but I was helping out. And, uh, some of these guys, these seminary students, would be there on, on duty all through the night, uh, watching over a location, and then in the morning go off to uh, the seminary to uh, study and to sit through lectures. Well, I uh, had that opportunity to work through the night and as a night watchman at a paper mill in Philadelphia. And I remember walking through this uh, factory from station to station as they would have different spots along the way that as a night watchman you had to check in and let them know that you actually walked through the building. And you're going through and it's dimly lit, shadows everywhere. Again, you're in Philadelphia, deep in Philadelphia. And there are these big rolls of paper stacked uh, throughout this warehouse. And who knows what's in the shadows as you're walking around there. And I was not particularly prepared for anything, so I was just hoping to get through the night. And thankfully, I was able to uh, get through that without any problems at all. Perhaps you've had that occasion as a night watchman, but it might not have been as a in a mill or something like that, but it might have been just being watching at night over a sick loved one, or watching over a child that uh, needs attention through the night, and you spend the night watching over that child or that loved one to make sure that they are healthy and uh, safe. Um, it requires a lot of attention, alertness, and so forth through the course of the night. Our text Interestingly, it tells us that in the course of this great work of God where he delivers his people out of Egypt, defeats the pagan gods of Egypt, makes a full display of them, demonstrates that he is the creator and they are the creature, they are not gods. Uh, God, as he rescues his people from slavery and bondage and brings them into a new land, is the one who watches over them through the night watches. It's a striking image that occurs at the end of this text that I read of God from heaven watching over his people. Especially so as the angel of the Lord goes from house to house, uh, putting the firstborn to death. And so as he went throughout all of Egypt, there was this great cry of distress as families awoke to see that their firstborn sons were put to death, firstborn children were put to death. And there was, however, silence and peace in the homes of Israel. Because as the angel of death passed over Israel, he saw the blood on the doorposts of each home. The story begins with Moses gathering the elders aside to talk to them. This is not the first time that Moses spoke directly to the elders of Israel. Uh, when he first came into Egypt, he spoke to them and announced what God was planning to do for them to deliver them from Egypt. He once more gathers the elders and talks with them. And uh, presumably they would go from Moses' presence and go out to those over whom they had responsibility and let them know what the instructions were for this night. And so you have here evidence within the life of Israel of a form of self-government did not simply rely upon the Egyptians to govern them. They had their own internal government with elders watching over the families. And so God had provided for them this structure, this clan structure, this family structure with elders within the life of Israel. And we know also that these elders represented Israel as they came before Pharaoh and talked to Pharaoh about their workload and things like that. God placed these elders in their midst to uh, watch over their families, their churches, their, their uh, people. And in particular, Moses gave them the task at this time to go and to select the Passover lambs. You recall the lambs were to be set apart and watched to see that they were uh, perfect animals. And here, uh, the lambs are all gathered together, perhaps in the, in the large pen area, and the elders are to go through these lambs and select which ones were actually indeed perfect and suitable for the offering. 
and then distribute these lamps to the families under their charge. It strikes me as something of a, a role that we have in our churches today. We are given elders to serve in the life of the church. We have a separate government within the family of the church, the, the people of God, distinguished from the state and its government. And the elders have a role in ministering to those under their care. And just as the elders of Israel gather to select the appropriate lamb for the families, so also elders today are charged to watch over the ministry of the Word of God, the Gospel, that tells of the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundations of the earth for our salvation. And so the elders are charged with ministering the Gospel with the true Christ, the perfect Christ, to the church. And not give in to the temptations of those around who would offer an imperfect sacrifice. A land that was not sufficient for the offering. It was an impotent land. It could only provide for a certain measure of forgiveness of sins. But it had to be supplemented by the sufferings of the people. The uh, sufferings of the Virgin Mary had to cross along with Jesus. There are other forms of suffering that someone needed to, to add to the, their lamb. The elders of the church need to resist that kind of a lamb. It's inadequate. Then you have what you have in the mainline churches today, the Protestant churches, where they might have a very nice lamb, but they're not going to sacrifice it. Pretty lamb. Let's pet this lamb and put it aside and keep it as a pet. But let's not sacrifice the land that's barbaric. And so they have no sacrifice for them, no Passover for them to protect them from the avenging angel. And so mainline Protestants do not have a suitable land provided for them to cover them for their sins. The elders of the church are charged to watch over the gospel of Christ. And make sure that it is proclaimed with clarity and faithfulness to the gospel that God has once for all delivered to the saints. You remember that the Apostle Paul first uh, gathered the elders at Ephesus together before he was to leave them. And he instructed them, warned them about the uh, wolves that would come into the flock, not sparing the flock. And he urged the elders to watch over themselves and the flock, that they not be led astray. To that end, they would need to make sure that the gospel of Christ is proclaimed faithfully and fully, and not give in to the false gospels that attempt to make their way into the church. So elders were responsible for watching over the ministry of the gospel. You have as well Paul instructing Timothy, 2 Timothy, to guard the deposit that was given to him, the gospel that was given to Timothy, and indeed, uh, in the second chapter, to pass on this gospel, this these words of sound doctrine, to others who will be able to likewise teach and, and instruct the church. And so there is a, a place within the life of the church for elders to make sure that the church is faithful to the Word of God and does not give in to the various false or imperfect sacrifices that the world would encourage us to make use of. You'll note that the experience of Israel here in Egypt was at a time when there was no tabernacle, there was no temple, there was no priesthood. What you had were families gathering together. And the families would be the ones who would slaughter the lamb and place its blood up on the doorposts, up above and along the sides. Some even suggest down below as well, on the doorstep as you go in, so that every aspect of the door was covered with blood. But these were families that were charged with this responsibility of providing a Passover lamb to protect their families from the angel of destruction. And it should be a reminder to us of the importance that God places upon the family 
and the spiritual life of that family. And how important it is for the heads of the households of those families to provide for the family, to point the family to the cross, to the blood of Christ. I think of the story of Job in the first chapter of that book, where Job is there with his family, and he's blessed tremendously with flocks and camels and herds, and his, he has seven sons and three daughters, and they celebrate their birthdays from time to time and all come together. And what does Job do for them? After their feasting, their celebrations are over, he makes an offering of the oxen or what, what have you in case one of his children in their hearts cursed God. And so he made it his responsibility to watch over the spiritual life of his family and to plead the mercies of God for the forgiveness of his sons and daughters should they wander away from the word of God. Husbands and fathers should likewise care for the families in such a way that they plead the merits and mercies of God, the merits of Christ and His blood, to watch over your children and their grandchildren, perhaps even great-grandchildren, that God will forgive them of their sins and watch over them. And so families are entrusted to care or to provide for their own and protect their young from the angel of death by pointing them to, to this blood sacrifice. You'll note that uh, as time goes on, they are to institute the Passover meal and celebration in the land of Canaan, that the children will come up to their parents and say, what is the meaning of this meal? Why do we have this Passover lamb? What's its significance? And the parents are to take that opportunity to explain to them that we were slaves in Egypt and God powerfully delivered us out of Egypt. And this Passover lamb reminds us of how God spared our families and judged the families of Egypt. And again, we're instructed to see the importance of families and the value that God places upon families in the life of His kingdom and this church. That parents should be instructing their children in the gospel of Christ that they would learn and understand the significance of the Passover lamb. Today, the enemy is very hard at work seeking to undermine the family and to destroy the family. The sexual revolution in the 1960s continues to have an impact upon our culture today. In the late, or late 80s into the 90s, you had the feminist movement taking hold within our country. And you have some like Saul Gordon writing that uh, marriage was a, a, a hardship upon women and it enslaved women and enslaved women to their husbands and forced them to be maids in the house and give them over simply to cooking meals and cleaning clothes and uh, taking care of the children. And Saul Gordon thought that women need to be liberated from this. And so the institution of marriage needed to be gotten rid of so that women and men could live on equal terms and have relations with whoever they want, whatever they want. That, in his idea, was liberation. Then you have Anna Laura Gaylor, who was saying that we should no longer be following the mythical Jesus. Uh, who really resulted in uh, 2,000 years of oppression through a patriarchal society upon women. No, women should look to the feminine goddess that, so that they can be delivered from the mythical Jesus. Well, I would agree with her, let's be delivered from the mythical Jesus. We don't need a mythical Jesus, but what we do have is the historic Jesus who acted in history and time to deliver us from sin and death and give us everlasting life, and who has made us as our creator and ordained how we should live before him, and brings blessing to us in marriages, blessings in families, blessings in the raising of children. Families.
kind of structure is for our good, for our comfort, and for our health. And actually, the feminist movement is bringing tremendous harm to both men and women and families and the future of the nation as well. And that's just one aspect of the attack on the family today. Christians need to be faithful to the Word of God and celebrate the marriages and families that God has given to them and secure family in the Gospel of Christ. The message of a crucified Savior whose blood atones for our sins so that we might be spared the judgment that is coming to the world. So, the elders select the, the lamb, the, the family slaughters the lamb, places the blood upon the, the doorposts of the, the house, and then the angel of death comes through the nation, and finally you have uh, Egypt waking up and seeing their children dead and saying, we got to get these Israelites out of here. We're going to be destroyed if they stay any longer. So they tried to hurry them out, give them everything they want. Do they ask for gold and silver? Fine, give it to them. They want jewelry? Fine. They want clothing? Fine, give it to them. Just get them out or we won't survive this. Even Pharaoh wants them out. And ironically asked them, and bless me too. <laughs> A little late for that, Pharaoh. <laughs> In any case, Israel was ushered out of Egypt, at, just as God had said. And what is more, it happened on the very day of the 430th year after which God had promised to Abraham that he would deliver his people out of Egypt and bring them back to the land of Canaan. God was watching over his people, making sure that they were safe and secure. And while his judgments came, came upon the Egyptians without mercy, because there was no blood sacrifice on their doorposts, we're reminded that there is coming a greater day of judgment. But again, there will be no mercy for those who do not have the blood of Christ covering them. One thing we need to appreciate about this text here is that it urges us personally to appropriate the blood of Christ to our hearts and lives. It's not sufficient to know about the gospel or to know about Christ or to be a part of the church. We need to personally come under the shelter of the blood of Christ. That is, through faith, to receive Christ's sacrifice for us to rest upon that alone so that we might be spared the coming wrath to come. Faith grasps the offering of the gospel that comes to us. Salvation through the blood of Christ. And we need to take that to ourselves. And so I ask you to consider, have you indeed sought refuge in the blood of Christ? Have you sought to have your sins transferred to Christ so that He might bear the full penalty of your sins? And do you rely upon that alone for pardon and cleansing and for a right relationship with God? Again, you need to personally receive that offer of grace. Grace it with your heart, from your heart, and trust in Christ alone. And so, we have the uh, Israelites being driven out. They go out in a hurry. They're off on their way. And God himself watched over them. And the Passover then would be established within Israel for generations to come. Indeed, for millennia. And it comes even into our present age. Where that Passover meal uh, can, comes to us through Christ. We see in, in all of Scripture that everything leads us to Christ and to His work. And even so here, this Passover meal points us to Christ and to His great work. The Passover lamb that would be slaughtered would be uh, a representation of 
the Christ who is offered for us. And with each Passover meal, there will be a, a glass of wine or a cup of wine and also some unleavened bread that would be part of that Passover meal. And you recall that Jesus met with his disciples on that Passover night and took the, the bread and said, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. Eat this. And then he gave them the cup and said, this cup is the cup of my blood of the covenant. Drink of it, all of you. And so in these elements, Jesus takes the Passover meal and applies it to himself and inaugurates the communion meal, which we will take part in momentarily. And so we, as the church, have a connection with that ancient people of God long ago. We continue this tradition of looking to Christ and his provision of salvation through the sacrifice of his own body for us. In this way, we remember Christ, whose blood was shed for us. This one who has entered into heaven to be our great high priest who watches over us even today. As he prayed for the disciples in that high priestly prayer that they would be kept from the evil one and sanctified in the truth, he likewise watches over us and prays for our protection from evil and our sanctification. And he leads us in a path to everlasting life. Jesus is that great night watchman who does not slumber or sleep. He watches over us and he blesses us and brings us safely into his eternal kingdom. And so we should rest in his provision for us. Father, we pray for your blessing on your word. We pray that you would help us to rejoice in your provision of grace through Christ and his offering. And we pray that you help us personally to know that his blood covers us that we are saved because of him. We pray in Jesus' name.
community table is given to the church for our nourishment and growth in grace. We come before our Lord and we are reminded of his sacrifice on our behalf. Through his death on the cross, he atoned for our sins. This communion meal reminds us of our union with Christ in his death. We partake by faith in the benefits of that death when we take part in this meal. The Spirit blesses uh, these, this bread and cup to our hearts and minds, strengthening our faith, reminding us of God's great love, and strengthening us for the journey ahead. We should be mindful that as we approach this table that we should approach in a worthy manner, and so we should be repenting of sin, resting in Christ alone for our salvation. Let's take a moment then to pray and seek for God's blessing in this communion meal. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mysterious and wonderful love that in eternity past you set us apart for yourself. Out of the mass of humanity, you were pleased to include us in Christ, to wash away our sins, to cover us with his perfect righteousness, to reconcile us to yourself, to declare us justified in your sight and therefore to say that there is no condemnation for us. We thank you, O Father, for this wonderful, mysterious, amazing love. And we do thank you that your spirit has in time produced that faith within us that we might believe the gospel of Christ, rest in Jesus alone for our forgiveness and everlasting life. And we thank you that your spirit has dwelt in our hearts ever since guiding and protecting us, correcting us, and upholding us. We thank you for your love for us. We do pray that as we take part in this meal and we are reminded of our union with Christ and our obligations to love and serve Him, we pray that you would bless this meal to our hearts and minds, to our souls and our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would once more give us a fresh appreciation for Christ and His glory for his wonderful work on our behalf. And we pray, Lord, that you would so minister to us that we will go from here with great joy and peace, knowing that our sins are forgiven, that we have a right relationship with God, that we are on the way to eternity, on the way to glory. We pray, Lord, then, for your blessing on this bread and cup. We thank you for that and ask your blessing on us for, with the forgiveness of our sins through Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.
In the same manner, our Savior also took the cup, and having given thanks, as had been done in his name, he gave it to his disciples as I, ministering in his name, give this cup to you.
shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, we equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, in whose, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.